You know, with this type of uh, uh, presentation, I'd really prefer to have kind of a, a discussion going back and forth because um, as I was telling Margaret and John when I first got here, in grad school I taught a hydrology course and physical geology for undergraduates. And uh, Margaret said, well, just go over the basics. And I said, well, in college I had a whole semester to go over the basics. Now I have 45 minutes. So um, so when we first went into you know, the, type, the, the presentation um, that Margaret had sent out today was Hydrology 101. So I started going, oh, what can I pick? What can I pick? What can come out of this as, as being uh, useful? And, uh, you know, being that you're members of the Watershed District Board, I don't believe this is Hydrology 101. I think you've got a lot of the background with the information from the, from the projects, with the, uh, the watershed work that's going on. You're far, much farther along than 101. Um, so what I'd like to do is I'll touch on some of the basics, like the hydrologic cycle um, and the interactions that we go through as part of it. But what I'd really like to do is present uh, the, the different data that are out there and how we utilize them. There's a lot of data that's being collected. And I think there's probably some information uh, that you've seen as part of these presentations before that, that uh, you'll be familiar with. Uh, certainly some of it I try to tailor towards the Middle Fork watershed. Um, but one thing I, I will ask is that any time that I get into a hydrology presentation, I tend to dig towards the data really quick. Uh, so if it gets too heavy, or if there are certain things that just don't quite jive, or if you'd like to ask some questions, please feel free to do so as we go along. So, so just to start, you know, with the hydrologic cycle, basically what we're talking about is uh, anything involving water. You know, on the land surface, we've got surface water, uh, groundwater, precipitation, evapotranspiration, any interaction with water on the landscape is, is hydrology. Um, like I said, it's a broad topic. It, it can cover so many things. What I'd really like to get into is how it moves and interacts with the environment. Now we're starting to talk about physical hydrology and once we get into uh, applied hydrology, more specifically the uh, practical applications of hydrology, you know, we start to talk about where does it make sense? Where do um, where does hydrology fit into the work that we do? And we start talking about physical hydrology, like surface water, uh, groundwater, precipitation, climate, those types of things. Those are all physical processes that help define our ability to work with the environment. Water use versus water conservation. I guess one of the reasons why I put this up here is that when we have an understanding of the hydrology, when we have an understanding of the water processes on the landscape, um, we can work towards sustainability with a lot of uh, our projects, a lot of, you know, um, everything from clean water implementation projects, restoration to, uh, to flood control, to erosion and sediment control. Um, you know, throughout the world there are other applications, wastewater treatment, uh, water supply, everything like that uh, makes use of hydrology data. So what I found um, through several courses and whatnot that I've taken, there's lots of figures that I like to use and reuse. And this, to me, presented a nice, um, kind of well-rounded data set to say, okay, physical hydrology, this is what we're talking about, where water exists on the land surface, what condition it is, what kind of process we have like precipitation. But the applied hydrology, that's really where we come into using it as part of our daily, need, our daily, uh, daily, daily uses. Water supply, flood control, irrigation, uh, soil conservation, those types of processes really come into play. So one of the things that, as part of this uh, these types of presentations that as a DNR employee I'm required to put in there uh, is the healthy watershed components. Uh, hydrology doesn't stand alone throughout the watershed. Hydrology is part of a larger interconnected system that incorporates biology, geomorphology or, or how water changes the landscape, uh, connectivity of our water resources including surface water, groundwater connectivity, as well as water quality. Uh, you know a lot of the things that as watershed district board members uh, you're involved in and that your staff informs you on are related to uh, either impairments of impaired water resources, substandard water quality, so on and so forth, or protection uh, style features that, that have excellent water quality. Those are the ones that, you know, you take some of the resources in this area, in this watershed, Green Lake, Lake George, Calhoun, have good water quality, uh, and those are the, the elements that we're looking to protect. But they're all interrelated. You know, good water quality comes from um, the nature of the connectivity and hydrology on the landscape. And biology and geomorphology are representative of those healthy watershed connections. So, part of my job, the reason why Margaret and John asked me to do this presentation is, is part of my job is to assess the changes to hydrology and determine what's causing those changes on the landscape. Um, 
that's, I think, one of the huge portions of your job as well. I mean, that's really what drives uh, all of the, the restoration efforts in the watershed. Um, you know, for example, one of the things that we try and do is collect as much information on uh, how precipitation is handled in the landscape. So this is County Ditch 27, tributary to West Norway Lake in the northwest part of Candiaway County. And uh, during the late 1990s, early 2000s, we had water samplers out there. So after a one half inch rain, water samples were collected. And you can see that there is a lot of sediment in the initial water here. Um, similarly, when we start to take a look at like the confluence of the Minnesota and the Mississippi rivers, the Mississippi River looks like it is crystal clean drinking water compared to the Minnesota where it comes in. And these are some of the problems that we begin to address, that we're trying to address through uh, our outreach programs and implementation through partnerships with local government units like the Middle Fork uh, and Candioi County. So here's where we start to get into some of the data heavy stuff. In specifically talking about hydrology, um, the way that I tried to look at hydrology as a part of this presentation was as per a lot of the data that we collect and use to determine what's happening on the landscape. So. Hydrology has four basic dimensions. Uh, the first one is longitudinal hydrology, and that's essentially what's happening in a watershed from the headwaters to the outlet. How is it changing from the first drop of water that falls way up upstream to the mouth of the water when it, it comes out of the watershed? Um, the second one is lateral hydrology. You know, the channel uh, connect connectivity to floodplain is a really big issue. Um, it's one of those that, you know, it, it changes drastically as we go throughout the watershed, but it also has a lot of components that affect um, uh, the human condition, so to speak. I mean, there's a lot of development floodplain areas. Uh, flooding directly impacted. Some of our most um, productive agricultural land is in the floodplain areas, and those uh, are incorporated there. Um, surface water to groundwater through vertical connectivity. Vertical hydrology is one that it's an element in everything we do, however, we don't understand it terribly well. And it's incredibly variable, uh, and it's very difficult to quantify uh, based on the variability throughout the watershed. And the last one is uh, temporal hydrology. You know, changes over time. This is one of the big things that I'll be discussing today because it's one of the um, aspects of hydrology that we're most readily moving forward with and presenting as part of our watershed efforts. So, now to the, the meat and potatoes. What do we measure? Um, the transition from physical hydrology to applied hydrology is all data driven. You know, we have to collect data to find out what's going on in the landscape. So, you know, the elements that we measure include like uh, climate trends, precipitation, drought, um, stream flows, uh, lake levels, geomorphic stability, landscape level trends, and groundwater levels, as well as um, surface water interaction. So, what I'd like to do as part of this presentation is instead of trying to go through and uh, describe all the interrelationships because everything is related. I'd just like to show you a few examples of each of these uh, types of data and how we use them as part of our, our daily work and part of our uh, outreach efforts. So climate trends. Climate is one of the big ones. Climate is huge in, in obviously there's a lot of conversations ongoing. Um, this graph represents what we call the Palmer Hydraulic Drought Index. So we've developed methods of basically quantifying um, precipitation over the course of a water year. And instead of applying it to, well, last year we got 26 inches, this year we got 16, how much uh, does that really incorporate? We've looked at it in terms of uh, a, a trend line. So this is from 19, or excuse me, 1895 through 2015. Each of these little blue dots on here uh, represents the hydraulic drought index for the year. Um, the zero line is average precipitation, so that's that's essentially the average amount of precipitation that's been received in this Minnesota Climate Division 5, which is essentially west central Minnesota, over this 120 uh, year period. So each one of these indicates how much precipitation uh, we've received on an annual basis and how that compares to our average uh, water year precipitation over the course of record. So as you can see, there's quite a bit of variation. You know, some years were well above the average, some years were well below. Um, the different gradations in color, you know, the farther we get above the average, uh, the more wet cycle, or the more towards a wet cycle we are, the lower we get, the more towards the extreme droughts we are. As you can see, 
uh, you can really pick out the extreme droughts. Here's the Great Depression, that uh, 1920s to 1930s. Um, here's the late 1980s. But then, of course, we go through the extremely wet cycles, too. I mean, the late, or excuse me, 1986, excuse me, 1985, 1986, uh, and so on and so forth. But one of the interesting things that we try and do with climate is look at a seven-year moving average. With the hydrologic drought index, it's really more indicative of what's our gradual trend, what's our average trend over the course of time. Um, and that's the red line that goes throughout here. And really and honestly, over the course of any given period, uh, aside from the 1920s and early 1930s, we're really pretty close to average. You know, we have the, the wet cycle in the mid-1980s and again in the late 1990s. But by and large, the average is pretty close to the average. So along those lines, we took a look at precipitation specifically as well. Um, the dash green line in the center is average. The lower line here is um, the 20, excuse me, the 75th percentile. So that means it's 75% of the years we receive more precipitation than this, and the upper line is the 25th percentile. So um, you know, only 25% of the years on a record are over that level. So long story short, we have years that vary. We get wet years, we get dry years. But really trying to take a long-term trend to determine what's happening in the longer term on our landscape. Uh, is is uh, what we're looking for with a lot of this data. And really, when we take a look at the next slide, which is stream gauging, it's very easy to see changes in a short term. You know, we can go from a, a dry February, March to a very wet April, May, and you can see the hydrograph changes dram dramatically. But when we look at the long-term trends in the hydrograph, you know, multi-year, decadal type uh, shifts, this is the information we really have to fall back on and say, okay, is it climate? Are we getting more precipitation over the last five to seven years that's driving higher stream flows? Or are we seeing something else happen in the watershed? So, Nathan, yes? What does that represent? Minnesota, the United States, or the world? This is actually uh, annual precipitation at the Rockford Station. So it's at near the outlet, outlet of the Crow River, uh, right in Rockford. So we have precipitation data collected for uh, several hundred stations throughout Minnesota. They don't always show the same trend. There's some areas that show, you know, little different blips here and there. Uh, but on average, this is uh, what we're seeing for this Locally. part of the world. Yes, okay. central Minnesota. <clears throat> what, is the, what is the average amount? The average amount of precipitation always put me on the spot. Um, for this part of the world, we're looking at about 28.9, 28.8 inches. Uh, somewhere between, somewhere between 28.8 and 29.8 inches of precipitation per year. Um, one thing that I wanted to show, but is very difficult to show, I've got one slide that kind of gets to it a little bit later, um, is the shift in when we're receiving precipitation. Um, a lot of our rivers, uh, lakes, or fish or water systems in this part of the world used to be driven by snow melt. Um, snow was the primary driver in our precipitation cycle. Now we're seeing less snow and we're actually seeing more early or late spring, early summer rains, and that's beginning to be the most portion we're receiving more of our precipitation as a whole. Uh, in addition, we're also seeing those episodic rain events, those 8, 10, 12 inches over the course of the wintertime. Um, one of the, and, and this is all assembled later on, uh, not here, but in a different report that we're trying to, to uh, basically assemble for every watershed in the state as we go through the wraps and one watershed, one plant processes. Um, the number of high-end rain events that we're seeing is increasing by decades since the 1950s. So it's not just a, a this year trend uh, or anything like that. And that's universal across the entire watershed. Uh, and that's related a lot to the climate shift that we're, we're seeing throughout uh, this part of the world, throughout the whole world. So, but now we get to stream flow. And, and once again, please, if we get to any of these, because I'm going to go through a lot of graphs and it's very data heavy and, uh, um, I started to go bug-eyed at the end of the day just trying to put the presentation together with all the graphs. So if anything doesn't quite jive or you have any questions, please let me know. So this is stream flow. Uh, this is the gauge on the middle fork of the Crow River downstream of the outlet of Lake Calhoun. Uh, and this is discharged from 1949 through uh, 2018, actually. This includes the 2017, excuse me, the data from um, up through the end of the fall. And, you know, when we start to relate these, this information, climate and precipitation, to this data. Um, you know, what I tend to try and take a look at is, once again, those multi-year moving averages. I guess I would call your attention to, uh, come on, laser, right here. 
you know, uh, in the winter time, a lot of times what we're seeing through uh, the 40s, the 50s, 60s, 70s, is we would get somewhere down near that zero flow range. We saw relatively frequently that there was not much water moving through in the winter time. In the late 80s, when we started to get through this, um, or the middle 80s, we started to get to this very wet cycle, stream flows ramped up. So, you know, in, in this type of a system, we never got, especially across the four years here, we never actually got down towards that zero range. We always maintained 30 to 40 cubic feet per second of water flowing out through the watershed. And with a watershed like this that has a lot of basinal storage, you know, we've got the main stem, middle fork running right through the lakes, I would anticipate seeing this. This is more indicative of uh, very high water conditions throughout the watersheds and those basins outlining over the course of the year. Yes? When we bought our house, they said that the summer of 88 was one of the driest, it was the driest in Kandiwari County. Does that coincide with what you're saying up there, or is that just folklore? This would, well, no, it, it depends on, you know, whether we're specifically talking about rain received or water levels. Um, water levels. Water levels. Okay, so for Lake Calhoun, I'd have to go back and look through the record. I've got um, lake levels for Green Lake in here a little later on. And that goes back to the 1940s as well. So, but all the lakes, and when you looked at lake property, were all really low. And everybody said that that was very un unnatural for that, for this county. And, and I, I would, was just curious if that showed up in your type of data as well, that that was a, is that a drier year, or? Yes, as, as per the, the drought severity indices, you know, we got to that 1988-89 uh, was extremely dry. You know, this the purple kind of signifies an extreme drought, something that we don't normally get to. For instance, uh, this spot here signifies 2012. Um, you know, where we got we got very dry, but we were, you know, it was kind of the first experience with drought we'd really had since the late 80s, and uh, we were starting to get down there, but we were really only in the moderate drought category. I mean, it wasn't nearly, it wasn't exp um, coming close to that 1980s uh, drought that we received. So. Um, this one is, is a, a graph that I'm going to relate some other information to as well. So from discharge, essentially what we're able to do is to create relationships between pre precipitation and discharge. So this is what's called a cumulative mass graph. This takes the discharge data from the Middle Fork uh, Crow River Stream Gauge and essentially assembles it as a cumulative volume. So this is, a, this is basically from uh, 1949 when we started collecting data at the gauge. It started at zero and we just added from there. So all the precipitation, whether it's you know um, a two-inch rain, a three-inch rain, so have you just added on, and uh, this is cumulative precipitation. So everything, a cumulative runoff. So everything that flows past the gauge has been accounted for as part of that um, stream gauge system. So to try to tend to think of it as a the amount of water coming in and the amount of water going out, um, based on the land use characteristics, the amount of wetlands, the amount of lakes. Um, the amount of pervious surface, those types of things in the watershed, there's a basic relationship that's established. And what we're looking for is a significant change in this relationship um, to signify, you know, okay, if it was, if what we're seeing for higher stream flows, so if we go back here, what we're seeing for higher stream flows in the 1970s and 1980s uh, is climate driven, uh, meaning we have more precipitation in the watershed, this relationship really shouldn't change. Because we have more rain, we should have more runoff. That makes sense. If we're seeing something else happen, something where um, you know we have land use changes or something uh, additional is happening in the watershed and we see runoff increase beyond the rate of precipitation, then we would see some kind of significant change in this relationship. So for the middle fork of the Crow, uh, this is through 2013. I have yet to update the figure that's happening this, hopefully next week, maybe the week after. Um, we're seeing a very stable relationship. It's really not changing much across the period of record. Um, the North Fork of the Crow, have, however, at, at uh, Rockford, too, this is the Crow River, not just the North Fork, um, we see a significant change in that relationship. You know, beginning in uh, about 1981, 1980, we see a significant change where all of a sudden we've got more water running off the landscape per inch of precipitation than what we had before. So making the relationships between these data is really what helps to drive what's happening uh, in our, or what we present in our reports. Yes? So in, a, in an urban area, that would most likely be impervious surface. In an agricultural area, is that more tiling or more water added to the system? That's or a great question. 
the why is the big the big one. That's what we're looking for, and that's why we tend to collect so much data and so many different types of analyses to try and point our fingers in the same direction. Um, you know, as part of the One Watershed, One Plan effort, this, this graph is actually from uh, the Houston Altered Hydrology Report, uh, and that's where they're trying to determine if hydrology in the North Fork of the Crow a watershed is altered. And if it is altered, um, well, there's kind of two approaches, saying, okay, number one, if it's altered, what can we do to fix it? What do we need to do to get back to a, a more pre-existing relationship type status? And then there's uh, the aspect of, okay, well, what specifically is causing it? Um, if it was a Twin Cities metro area where we have increasing urban sprawl and, and development uh, over the last, let's see, since, you know, like the, the early 1980s, late 1970s, we might be able to make that relationship and say it's impervious surface. Um, but based on the fact that we're predominantly rural in this watershed, uh, it's very likely something else. Something else is going on that's making this relationship change. What um, conclusions have you reached? <laughs> the million dollar question has been asked. <laughs> this is, well, I'll get to that a little bit more in, in just a little bit too, but um, this is, I want to make sure everybody knows, this is downstream of the confluence of the North Fork and the South Fork Crow. Um, the reason I said that is because the land use characteristics and uh, the watershed characteristics in terms of like number of lakes, acreage of lakes, uh, those types of things is significantly different between the North Fork and the South Fork. Uh, therefore, runoff characteristics we assume are going to be significantly different. So, the fact that we need long-term gauge data to, to develop this relationship, you know, going back to like the 1930s, um, we're using newer gauge data uh, that began collecting upstream of the confluence, so individually for the North Fork and individually for the South Fork, that began about 2004. And we're trying to work through some of the longer-term relationships to, to make that specific assumption, saying, okay, is it the North Fork, is it the South Fork, um, what's happening? Uh, we haven't been able to make those relationship leaps yet. We've got lots of hypotheses as to what's happening. Um, but one of the things that we've talked a lot about is, um, and once again, this is where we're being recorded, so I hesitate to, to make conjecture or anything like that. There are several theories out there. One is it's related to wetland drainage. Um, you know, the fact that we have uh, in the late 1970s, uh, DNR public water, excuse me, Minnesota public waters law uh, was updated to include the public waters inventory. And uh, we also began, and this is, whoops, this is one thing that we're starting to, to, to try and make a more specific relationship to. There was a shift in the types of plants that were, or types of crops that were planted. Um, soybeans were utilized, um, you know, back all the way to like the 1940s, but really started to get big. And we got away from small grains beginning in about the 1980s. And that's a significant shift in when the plants use water and how much water those plants use. Uh, take wheat or oats or anything like that, for instance. Um, it has a, a significant relationship to you know, how much cover is left, how early that plant germinates, when it starts to use water, or the amount of residue left in the landscape um, versus soybeans, which is you know, significantly different. You know, in addition, this is when we began to see uh, the transition from a lot of small uh, family farms to bigger operations. Uh, and when we started to get to, you know, away from the smaller family farms which had, you know, uh, small grains and those type of things to larger uh, row crop type situations, uh, it presented a different runoff characteristics for the landscape as a whole. Um, really a lot of it is likely related to the amount of water storage in the landscape, whether it's storage in soil or storage in wetland features. So, um, and this, this next figure kind of supports that. So this is from the Palm de Terre River. Um, this is zero flow days at the gauge station, which is in Appleton. So essentially what we're looking at is prior to 1978, all except for about seven of the zero flow days at the gauge occurred in January, February, and March. Um, now, post-1978, uh, and this is really uh, essentially all in 1987, 88, 89, the zero flow days were in July, August, September, October, and a couple in November. And really what that's leading us to believe is that when we have um, a lot of wetland storage on the landscape, there's a significant portion of the runoff that is, is essentially held through the land, through the, on the landscape through the, winters, um, the winter times. You know, the wetlands don't outflow, a lot of the smaller lakes don't outflow in the winter time. Um, as those systems change, as we develop more runoff on the landscape, uh, you know, and, and tile drainage is a good example. I'm not pointing a finger, but it's a good example. When we have uh, tile drainage in, there's a lot of times where those tiles will flow 
all the way through the, the summer uh, and into the winter. And then it, it kind of takes away uh, some of our base flow characteristics. So we have in the past, um, where our zero flow days were in January, February, March, um, those were the, the times when we had water stored in the landscape that once everything melted would begin to flow again um, and would provide that base flow for the summer months, you know, even though it was a little bit, we still had wetlands and lakes and whatnot outflowing. Um, in the post-1978 era, you know, what we're looking at is there is um, fewer basins providing that base flow. So we're seeing less water input into the stream in the, uh, the summer months. And that's just a relationship we're trying to establish. Once again, it doesn't point a finger at anything, and I, I, that's one of the, when you ask, so what's, what's causing this? Um, it's very difficult to point the finger and say, this is the culprit, because hydrology is very complex, uh, and there's a lot of things changing on the landscape. And saying that one thing is, and demonizing one thing, is, is very difficult to do, and I try and avoid doing that at all costs. So I'm going to have to move quickly to get through the rest of it here. Um, gauges and sequence is something that's very important. So this is the Bonanza Valley, groundwater management area. Um, this is the northern part of Candioi County right here, getting up into uh, Stearns County, Pope County, and whatnot. Um, these gauges represent the stations on the North Fork of the Crow. I apologize for the crudity of the figure. I was trying to get some more in, but 515 came around, and I hate um, to continue my reputation of being late. So essentially what we've got is gauges that have been installed on the East Branch Ship River, Ashley Creek, and the North Fork of the Crow. In these areas, what we've seen over the last to, uh, three to five years is during summer months, um, the stream is losing water. You know, the subsequent gauges, these gauges, uh, we're seeing actually lower flows at these gauges and the gauges upstream. So it's creating a losing reach in the stream. Whereas, you know, we typically think of as from upstream to downstream, we should be gaining water in a stream. It just doesn't make sense. As we go downstream, we'll have less water. But then as we get farther downstream in the North Fork, we're gaining water again. So, you know, what we're seeing is uh, there's a lot of near-channel irrigation in this area that is likely having a negative impact on, on water flows. Now, is that sustainable? Is it significantly impacting the river? That's what our Bonanza Valley Groundwater Management Area Plan is, is looking to do. Are there, um, red, are there red lines in the Bonanza Valley? The, the large line, the large area here is the Bonanza Valley. Uh, groundwater management area, yes. Oh, the whole area is. The whole area is, yep, yep. And I my, I have a map that's in draft form on my computer that I couldn't get everything on. It's got county boundaries, main stem channels, uh, and whatnot. That makes it a little bit easier to read, but this is the one that I could I could get out in time. So um, if you'd like an updated copy of this, I can certainly provide that when it's ready. Um, lake level. So here we go. This is what we were talking about before. Uh, Green Lake, we have water levels going back to 1940. Um, as you can see, this is one of the tools we try and use to determine if something is happening in a lake watershed that is unusual as per the historic record or if what we're seeing is just uh, water level trends uh, on a multi-year basis. So here's the 1980s is what we're looking at right about 1987, uh, 1988, 1989, and then of course we start to get wetter as we go back. Uh, but then again, in I guess the other, the other area that I like to look at is right about 2000, 10, 2011. Um, the ordinary high water level for green is really when we start to see water on the, the county road four bridge, you know, right on the adjacent to it. Water comes right up to the edges of it when we're close to the ordinary high water level for green. We've only exceeded it in our period of record um, four times. Well, three times actually. This one got close in, in 2013. Um, but in 2011, uh, it got very wet. We had some big rains going into 2010 in the fall. In the spring, we started out with a lot of rain. Uh, the same continued up through 2012. This was July of, of uh, no, excuse me, it will be August of 2011. And then starting in August, the, the bottom fell out. We didn't have hardly any rain. It was very little snow melt, and we started to see very low levels come about in um, 2013, the beginning, or excuse me, middle of 2013 before we began to recover. So um, this is information that we look towards. This is George Lake. Uh, once again, we see that significant drop in the mid-1980s. Um, but this is one thing I guess I'd like to present with George, is that earlier, well, it would have been 2017, the outlet to George Lake was plugged. Um, we had to bring the county in several times to blow some sand, and uh, there was a nice log jam in there. I don't know if it was um, related to a beaver or something like that, having a little bit of fun. But we began to see, you know, the historic record showed that we had water levels that were below the ordinary high water level uh, up through 2010. And then... The county actually worked on the outlet in 2012, they worked on it in 2014, and we still saw water levels that were up near the ordinary high. 
So this water level of record helped to us, us to say, okay, we need to get back out there again, see what's going on. Um, and this also helps to relate to climatic trend data, saying, okay, what are we seeing? Long-term droughts. Um, the early 2010s where we were very wet again, is it tracking? Are we seeing something different? And I put the two gauge records up here for Green and for George because we have um, basins that are both very high quality but are significantly different watershed composition. George has a very small watershed, Green has a very large watershed. And seeing the differences between the two in Iraq uh, are extremely important. So um, geomorphic stability is one that we're working on uh, as much as possible and, and um, the watershed district has also undertaken a significant effort in the Middle Fork, uh, especially downstream of the Calhoun Outlet, uh, to try and look at bank stability. And a lot of what we're really trying to record is a number of things. You know, it's um, not just channel conditions through surveys, but it's also floodplain condition. You know, if we have good floodplain connectivity where the channel is readily accessible or the floodplain is readily accessible during moderate flows, that indicates that we've got a, a, a good hydrologic regime. If we have characteristics like fallen trees, uh, mid-channel sediment bars, uh, those types of things, we're documenting those and coming back and saying, okay, this is really indicative of either an altered channel or something's going wonky with the hydrology uh, in the system. So here's an example of uh, channel cross-sections. You know, at the Lilleberg site, we collected a number of cross-sections, and that really helped to define how much area should be left in the channel to allow for flow during uh, moderate flow periods. Uh, and how high up we needed to go with, with the protection uh, when it came to the high flow periods. And this is the kind of information that can be very helpful on a site-by-site -site basis. It's difficult to quantify in a watershed, however. And here, I, there it is. There's the areas that the Middle Fork is focusing on downstream of the Calhoun Lake outlet um, for restoration. And this is incorporating a lot of that geomorphic stability um, type. It, it's the same basic processes that we're trying to do throughout other watersheds in the state to really quantify uh, what's happening. and. I wanted to put the regional curve information on here, and regional curves are essentially taking a look at overall channel area uh, as a reflection of watershed area. So we expect that in um, certain watersheds, well in watersheds that have a certain size, including certain soil characteristics, certain slopes, so on and so forth, we're going to see a certain size channel, right? So it's representative of kind of the amount of flow that's going through there. Um, if we survey a channel and it has an area that's significantly above what we anticipate, we kind of go, hmm, something's going on here, something doesn't make sense. Or if it's significantly below, we say, ooh, maybe we've got a reference condition. Something is happening in this watershed that's protecting this channel. And those are really good indicators of the relationships between land use, um, land condition, and what's happening in the channel. Um, and sometimes we get to go out and have a little fun, too. So this was a really hot day. Uh, I happened to be the one who was running the level on the other side and writing everything down so I didn't get to um, take a bath. but. Um, <laughs> that w it was in August, so it would have been April. I it, it, uh, it wouldn't have been the first to volunteer. So, landscape level changes. Um, this is the type of data that we're really trying to record to to inform those studies uh, related more to hydrology and how everything is. Excuse me, related more to the stream gauging data and precipitation data to really determine what's happening on a landscape scale. So what I did here was this is from the Watershed Health Assessment Framework. Uh, that DNR has assembled. Our, our stream hydrology unit is really working on trying to categorize condition uh, across the state um, with regards to several categories. And these are specific to the hydrology indices that have been developed. So this is impervious cover. Um, green indicates good, red indicates bad. So for the Middle Fork Crow, obviously the most significant portion of development is right around the Green Lake Ness Lake area in London Spicer. That's where the impervious surface comes in. But the vast majority of the rest of the watershed is in pretty good shape. So we wouldn't anticipate that impervious surface is going to be a significant alterator, alter, bleh, help me out here, factor in altering hydrology except for the near uh, riparian areas for Green Lake and Nest Lake there. For the North Fork of the Crow watershed, it gets a little bit, little bit different. Uh, as you can see, there is a significant amount of urbanization, impervious surface coverage, um, the Painesville area, Litchfield area as we get along uh, around Lake Washington, Lake Manuel, Estella, um, town, city of Buffalo, so on and so forth. There's a there's a, a few watersheds where we can really say, oh, this might be driving what's happening in the near channel area. Uh, the same for hydrologic storage. This is really an indicator of uh, how much storage we have in basinal areas on the landscape. So the upper portion of the watershed, um, you know, the Long Lake watershed, um, the direct watershed for Ness Lake and Green Lake, they all look pretty good. I mean, even the upper portions of the watershed are really pretty good. 
But when we get downstream, we start to see a little less hydrologic storage, a little less basinal storage in the landscape. So we would anticipate that potential runoff characteristics would change in these areas. By and large, however, the Middle Fork Crow looks pretty good when you look at the rest of the watershed. We've got a lot of areas with a lot more wetland impacts and drainage than uh, the Middle Fork. Um, along those lines, you know, here's the stream response to rain that we would anticipate as part of that. You know, in areas that have a lot of basal storage, a lot of, um, there it is, perennial cover, we would anticipate seeing a much lower peak on the hydrograph and a longer period for runoff following a rain event. That will change uh, depending on land use cover changes. So. Perennial cover is much the same way. Uh, you know, when we talk about perennial cover, it's, it's land that's not in production or land that is uh, incorporating some type of practice that, inc that uh, incorporates long-term cover, cover crops, residue management, those types of things. Um, the upstream area for Green Lake, uh, and the, the majority of the Middle Fork watershed, is really pretty good for perennial cover. You start to see less perennial cover as we get downstream, um, and that's really indicative of the entire watershed. Actually, as you go farther south and west of Minnesota, uh, perennial cover gets less and less, but by and large, in the Middle Fork, or excuse me, the North Fork watershed, the Middle Fork uh, is is one of the best, one of the best players there. Um, and altered water courses. This is the last one I put up, I believe, is really in regards to um, the number and uh, length of natural channel features that we got out there. So there's a lot of ditches in the red areas and more natural channels in the green areas. Uh, but once again, that's widespread throughout the watershed. You can see the areas that are most highly ditched. Um, and while the green areas do incorporate some ditching, they really do incorporate a lot of the naturally meandering portion of the North Fork of the Crow, and that tends to, to weight the scores. So, so we use this data um, with regards to you know, anticipating what's going to happen on the landscape, what would be the drivers for hydrologic response. Um, I wanted to take a specific example with regards to land use from the Chippewa River watershed that I put together as part of a hydrology report out there. So there's three separate subwatersheds. One is the East Branch Chippewa, the Shakopee Creek watershed and then the Dry Weather Creek watershed. Um, they represent increasing amounts of transition from natural uh, perennial vegetation and uh, basinal storage in wetlands and lakes. Um, there's fewer in the Shakopee than there are in East Branch Chippewa and there are fewer yet in the Dry Weather Creek than there's in Shakopee. So the blue area is essentially land that's in row crop. And what we try to do is take a look at hydrologic response from those areas um, in response to precipitation events. So we have gauge stream or stream gauge records from the exact same periods and because they're relatively close together in the landscapes the precipitation events were predominantly the same size. So the green line represents East Branch Chippewa River, the red line which is difficult to see is Shakopee Creek and the blue line is Dry Weather Creek and this is water yield and basically it's discharge per square mile so this is normalized for each of the watersheds and what we're seeing is that as we get um, farther away from the open water wetland areas and uh, grass pasture or small grains, we're seeing a much more significant hydrologic response. We're getting more water to come off the landscape when we have fewer of those features. So it, it points in the, in the direction of uh, that information. In addition, with land use changes, we started to take a look at land and production um, just to really try and figure out if that's driving what's going on. So this is from department, or excuse me, it's data from the Department of Agriculture back to the 1920s. And what we're essentially seeing, and I don't think it's any surprise to anybody, is that there's more land in production per county. Blue line is Chippewa, the red line is Swift, and the green line is Pope County. There's more land in production in all of those, um, all of those counties. And it's really trending towards you know, uh, being able to, to utilize the marginal areas as farming practices have changed and whatnot. And once again, I'm not trying to demonize any practice. It's more trying to compare land use trends on a long-term scale to the sea. Uh, comparatively, over time, what's happening to the hydrograph. Uh, and this is kind of what we referred to before, a change in cropping history. So the green line represents wheat. I think that's the one that really transitions to what's going on. Uh, and the red line is soybeans. So beginning in about 1950, we saw a significant increase in soybean production and a significant decrease beginning in the late 70s, early 80s in wheat production, to where it's all um, row crop, soybeans and corn. So, you know, it's just uh, pointing towards that information. Um, I have about 15, or no, not 15, I'd say 10 slides left to go, and we're at 6.30, and I don't want to impede the rest of the board meeting. Um, I can try and burn through it, if, if the board feels that it's useful. Okie dokie. So groundwater levels uh, is another, another uh, facet of hydrologic data that we collect. This is an area up right on the border of Candio Eye and Stearns County. Now this is... Uh, County Road 9 as we go to the north. 
uh, Follies WMA, and this orange dot is a uh, DNR observation well. So we're monitoring groundwater levels in the subsurface aquifers there. The green squares are all uh, center pivot irrigation rigs. Uh, and, oh man, I forgot to order it. So essentially what we're seeing here is the red line indicates um, static water levels in the well. There's no actual pumping going on at this well. We're just reflecting what's happening in the subsurface aquifer. The water level trends that we're seeing uh, show increasing drawdowns as we get up through like 2012, 2013. Uh, and as everybody remembers, 2012, 2013 were drier years. So there was more water being used up in this area for crop irrigation. Um, but one of the things that's troubling isn't specific to the decreasing levels of, of um, the drawdowns, but actually if you look at the recovery limb, so as it comes back up, you know, this is essentially uh, August, um, middle August of every year is when we see the peak drawdowns occur. But the recovery is when we get back up to pre-existing static elevation. Uh, in this particular aquifer, we're still getting back up to that static. So even though we drew down a long ways in uh, 20 or excuse me, 2012, we're still getting back to static elevation. However, that's happening later and later. Um, in the early 1980s, when we started monitoring, we were getting back to static elevation in October, November. Now we're seeing returns to static elevation in March and early April. So it's taking longer to recover. And really the big question that comes in here is sustainability. And, you know, as part of water use, water conservation, what we're really trying to promote, especially in the Bonanza Valley here, and trying to quantify, is what's sustainable. When do we hit the point where we're not going to recharge all of the way back up to pre-existing static elevation? Uh, and are there ways that we can assist uh, local land landowners in trying to uh, work towards sustainability? Um, you know, playing the regulatory role with Black Hat and just saying, bam, you used to get 12 inches, now you only get 6 inches of water to apply. It really isn't a good approach. You know, we understand this is the economic driver for the community. We understand that growth depends on use of water resources. However, we get to a point when we need to make sure and sustain or ensure um, sustainable use for future generations. You know, wherein is that fine balance? So that's really what we're after in the groundwater management areas. Um, I wanted to take advantage of some data that we've got. This is for uh, Granite Falls Energy. Um, beginning in 2002, they began to appropriate from a um, uh, an old alluvial channel aquifer that ran uh, just uh, were about five miles to the east of Granite Falls and what we saw was in okay so the red line here is the water levels in the observation well um, that's on site there the green is water levels in an observation well that's four miles away um, and the blue line here represents water levels in an overlying aquifer what we began to see was as they pumped this system we saw water level drawdowns more than four miles away, and we also began to see water levels in that overlying aquifer drop. And that indicates that we've got not a confined system that we're just pumping here and it's the only thing that's affected. It's affecting things in that overlying system. And we're seeing that more and more and more and more and more um, throughout you know, the, 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 this portion of Minnesota where we've got a lot of water use, and not just this portion, but also through the rest of the state. By overlying system, are you talking about the river down there? Uh, no, this is actually uh, an aquifer. Um, oh. that, that lies up over top of it. The, the aquifer system there um, is a significantly buried system. It's, it's about, uh, I think, 250 feet from the land surface down to the top of the aquifer. But there's an overlying system that's about 100 feet down. Uh, and what we were seeing was actually water levels in that overlying system drop down even though there was no wells uh, for this use in it. So we're seeing that in the Benson area. We're seeing, uh, we're actually, you know, um, Physically monitoring it in the Benson area, we're seeing it in the Granite Falls area, although since 2007, Granite Falls Energy has been pumping from the Minnesota River, uh, which is a more sustainable source than the groundwater resources there, and certainly that's not, not without uh, concern, of course. Um, Are Benson the ethanol plant? Uh, no, uh, Benson is really related to the limited nature of the aquifers there, and then as you get north and west of town, it's tremendously heavy um, used for crop irrigation. Certainly the ethanol plant comes into play uh, and is, is, a, is a user in all of this, but um, the predominant use, the majority of the use out there is, is related to high capacity irrigation. And once again, with this type of information right here, um, it's not, I don't want to give you the impression that we're in the emergency room with everything. I wouldn't even say we're headed to urgent care, but we're seeing signs of declining trends. And that's indicative of a, a larger issue that needs to be addressed before we have to go to urgent care. Uh, so, 
Groundwater interaction, as we discussed a little bit ago with regards to the river, uh, is essentially the rivers are usually representations, at least in this type of a geologic setting, where groundwater is being discharged to surface water. Um, you know, certainly where river flows are augmented by precipitation, but by and large they're a representation of the groundwater system. When we have uh, a significant pumping in a near channel area, we can induce drawdowns from the river into um, those wells and actually begin to lose water. And that's where, um, you know, we started to talk about before with the Bonanza Valley area, um, where we're in, excuse me, the green circles here incorporate all of the land that's irrigated in the Bonanza Valley. That's, that's uh, an allocation or a, a accounting of all of the irrigated land of the Bonanza Valley. Um, this shows where we have water level monitoring. One of the big points of the, mount of all of the Bonanza Valley plan is really trying to increase the amount of water level monitoring so we can figure out what's going on. The more data we have, the better off we are. And this goes back to where we saw those declines. So, you know, in those stretches of river, right in this area, um, you know, around the Belgrade and up towards Bruton area, we're beginning to see those stream level or uh, losing reaches being developed. So, I'm getting real close to the end market, I promise. Altogether, this data begins to compromise and, and consolidate into these hydrology reports or management plans. And really, all the data being used together is an opportunity to try and assess what's going on on a large scale. If we're looking for that smoking gun, I think it's very, very uh, unlikely we're going to find it. But with all this data, we have that opportunity to determine exactly what the condition of the watershed is, where we're seeing those uh, warning signs, where we're beginning to see those larger indicators of landscape scale issues, and address them. And that's really where I think that One Watershed, One Plan um, is using tremendous amounts of hydrolo hydrologic data to incorporate larger strategies. So you know, this is just one of those that um, I have to put in just about every presentation because you know we get those uh, those issues with landscape scale management. They can really boil down to what's happening on individual property. Uh, but it can also boil down to what's happening um, on a larger scale. You know, we start to see these big precipitation events and bam, something like this can happen if we're not properly managing water in the landscape. And, you know, this is indicative of what's happening on property. This type of management is, is really, um, it, it's not just on the one property, of course. We're seeing different kinds of management that aren't always sustainable in use, and it only takes one drop to start beginning to create issues. So... Six minutes over. I feel hoarse. <laughs> Any questions? What then mission data, accomplished. What data set do you think would you like to have that you don't have in doing the job? Oh, that's a great question. Um, if I could, if I could pick to have one data set across all watersheds, it would be the long-term data that we saw. Um, oops. Let's see if I can get back to it. I don't think I'm going to be able to get back to it. It was on the, the stream gauge data, the, the stream gauge data going back to the 30s, you know, because that's what really begins to help us make that long-term trend analysis um, and determine what has changed, what has been altered in that time frame that is. Or, you know, um, the other thing that we, we will see in some areas like the Middle Fork Crow is that things haven't changed. But to begin to make that assertion, there's so many different ways to manipulate that data uh, because we've got precipitation data in virtually every part of the state going back to the 1800s. If we had comparable hydrologic data from the streams that show uh, what's happening, you know, we're beginning to make those larger landscape scale assessments as to, to what's going on in the land surface. Uh, you know, by and large, like the Middle Fork of the Crow that has data going back to 1949 is one of the outliers. I mean, we don't have that kind of data all over the place. And when we do, that's great. So if we had some, that would be yeah. ideal. And I guess one of the things that I, I didn't quite sneak in that I really wanted to was as part of this presentation and going through the hydrologic assessments, the assessment that I'm putting together right now for the North Fork for the second round of the wraps, I just want to emphasize how good things in the Middle Fork are. I mean, by and large, uh, compared to the surrounding areas, the Middle Fork has got it good uh, with regards to hydrology. You've got good lakes, the water quality in the river is, is great, um, you know, really trying to make sure that we preserve, uh, in, in the wraps efforts and the One Watershed, One Plan efforts, the North Fork, Middle Fork was uh, prioritized as part of my input efforts as, as protection area. You know, you got good resources that need to be protected, and then we need to uh, maintain that hydrologic characterization. I think that was one of the driving forces for the people that started the watershed district is that they saw that things were not being maintained like they once were. And there's limits 
Well, and, and I, I really have to commend the, the efforts that the Watershed district has, go, district has gone through because of the amount of, of change that you've made on the landscape. I mean, you've got lots of active watershed residents, and some of the projects that have gone in uh, and that are going in are exceptional. Uh, I mean, it's really, I just, I, I, I can't physically reach out and pat everyone in here on the back, but I'd really like to because of the work that you do, I think is, it's exceptional. Okay. You've learned Thanks. from some of our failures as well. <laughs> I have some questions for you, but I'll Thank give you, you a call. That sounds great. Okay. I'll look forward to it. Thank you, everybody. Mm -hmm. Does it look the same when uh, Laura and Mississippi come together and date there? It, I don't have a, a whole lot of aerials, but to be honest with you, during certain times it looks like that when the North Fork and the South Fork come together. Um, I've seen pictures where the curl looks like Hershey's. And that's what the, the in my in my experience where the South Fork and the North Fork come together, a lot of times you're following big precipitation events, the South Fork is the one that looks a little chocolatey. But you know, um, along those lines I've seen that in many other places. You know, for instance where County Ditch nineteen, Meeker County Ditch nineteen comes into the middle fork of the Crow, um, just downtown downstream of the town of Crow River, right there. I've seen that look like that too. Um, and I believe the the County Ditch twenty eight system where it joins the Middle Fork. And it depends on where the precipitation events are. And, um, but on this kind of a scale, I can't say that I have seen the, the, the crow look like that with the Mississippi, but I have seen the two branches of the crow look like that. And I couldn't find that picture to add in here. That's why I had to use that one. I thought it was interesting where you said uh, around 1950 when they went from small grain to more row crops. That was about the time that my dad and my grandpa quit farming with horses. Really? So instead of a lot of oats, we went to more corn and, corn and soybeans because prior to that, they didn't need the same kind of crops. That's really interesting. Thank you. Thanks, Ethan. Thank, Thank you. And please, if there are any more questions, or if you uh, certainly, Margaret, if you want to keep a copy of the presentation and. And uh, anybody else comes up with any questions, please let me know. Perfect. Thank you, Thank you for having me.